Hi guys. You know, I've taught IELTS speaking to probably hundreds of students and I've helped thousands prepare for IELTS speaking. But interestingly, I often see the same grammar mistakes cropping up again and again. Well, today I'm going to show you the five most common grammar mistakes students make in IELTS speaking and explain why they're important and show you how to fix them. Let's do it. Hi, my name is Keith, and if you don't know me, um, I run uh, the website, the Keith Speaking Academy, and the YouTube channel, English Speaking Success. And I'm here to help you speak better English, give better answers, and get a higher score on the IELTS speaking test. I love my slogans, <laughs> right? It's interesting, right? Because whilst some mistakes, especially grammar mistakes, are particular to a certain nationality or let's say mother tongue, there are, and I've noticed teaching students around the world, the same mistakes, irrespective of mother tongue, the same mistakes that come up again and again and again. So I'm going to tell you what those five, the top five mistakes students make in speaking, IELTS speaking, and I'm going to try and help you fix them today, starting today. But trust me, you'll need to do a lot of work and a lot of practice after the video. Before we begin, I would just like to say a big, big thank you to Cambly. Um, I think Cambly are great, right? They are an online pl platform that offers teachers, native English speaking teachers, to help you learn English and improve your English. Okay, They have a very flexible um, system, so you can choose the teacher you want at the time that you want. You can study on your phone online or on your computer. Um, you can record the class and they have lots of materials and courses to help support your learning. But I think it's most important because when you're learning a language, English, for IELTS speaking, you need to practice and you need feedback to learn from your mistakes. And today we're talking about grammar mistakes. And it's one thing to know the mistakes, but another thing for somebody to be continually correcting you. So as you're practicing, to have a teacher who can give you feedback, you know, and say, is that right? Are you sure? Ah, it should be this and correcting you so you're getting better and better. So I think having a teacher is a great opportunity to improve. Cambly offer a wide range of teachers and lots of flexibility. So go and check them out. The link is below. Um, you'll get a discount on all their monthly plans if you use the code below um, or the link below directly. Great. Now let's get down to the serious stuff. Grammar. So number one is not adding the S when talking about other people in the present tense. We sometimes call this the third person S, right? When you're talking about he or she or it, in the present tense, there should be an S. So, for example, students may say, a person I admire is my uncle. He live in Canada. He work in a bank there. Now, what's the problem? Well, it should be, a person I admire is my uncle. He lives in Canada and he works in a bank there, right? Because he, she or it... The verb in the present tense, you should add an S or maybe an ES, depending, but the S sound. And of course, it's complicated because in English, the I, you, we, they, you don't change. It's the same. I live, you live, we live, they live. So you have to remember he lives or she lives. So what's the problem here? The problem is partly that as you're speaking, you forget with the he or the she because it's the exception that has the S, right? Sometimes the problem is pronunciation. So students may say, he lives in Canada. And I say, it's an S. 
and they say, oh, yeah, I said S. He lives in Canada. And they know there's an S and they think they've said the S, but maybe it's so quiet you can't even hear it. He lives, he lives in Canada, all right? So it may be a pronunciation problem. And here's the thing, right, with this mistake, is it's doubly bad. Because if you, if you say he live in Canada, you're making a grammar mistake and a pronunciation mistake. So it's doubly bad um, and it's problematic. So how do we fix it? Well, let's talk about pronunciation first. Okay. There are two different sounds um, that are important here. One is voiced and one is unvoiced. So verbs um, that end in a voiced sound or a voiced consonant and voiced means if you say, for example, live, live, you can hear or feel there's a vibration, a voice, live. Try that. Can you hear it? Live. When you add the S, the S is pronounced Z. The voiced continues. The voiced sound moves into the next consonant. He lives. He lives. She loves. He runs. Can you hear? It's a z sound because it's voiced. On the other hand, there are other consonants at the end of verbs um, that are unvoiced, like work. There's no voice. Work, like, want, laugh. So the sound here is works, likes, wants. It's a s sound. So that's the first thing. And I, so knowing the difference there is important. Next, you want to overemphasize. So you want to practice this, but overemphasize the S. So practice saying he lives in, uh, where was it? Canada? Yes. He lives in Canada. And practice carrying on the z like it's a b z he lives in canada she loves it right really overemphasize overemphasize because that's going to help train the muscles in your mouth and your memory as well because it sounds very very strange right um, likewise with unvoiced right he works in a bank uh, he likes working in the bank. Really overemphasize, and this will help you. Okay. In addition, you can become aware of linking or connected speech. I'll give you some examples, but you can see, for example, he lives in Canada. The z, when you connect the z sound, is much clearer. Lives in, right? lives in, zin, lives in. He lives in Canada. So when you're aware of the connecting or the connected speech, it can really help you pronounce the z better. He lives in Canada. She loves it, zit. She loves it. Try. Good, right? He runs a lot. Listen and repeat, the lot. He runs a lot. Great. Do the same with the unvoiced, right? He works as a, he works as a, as a what? <laughs> as an engineer, right? He works as, he works as, he works as an engineer. He likes it. Sit, like sit down. Sit. Like I'm training a dog. Sit. Repeat with me. He likes it. Okay. Or um, he laughs at my jokes. He laughs at my jokes. Laughs at. Sat in the past. Sat. <laughs> he laughs at my jokes. Brilliant. 
So again, be aware of that connected speech. And in the very common sentences, you can do that, right? He lives in London. Uh, he works as a teacher. Okay, great. Those may help you. And I think the last thing to work on to help fix this is just practice. Practice, practice lots of times, um, not just the one word, but a short phrase, right? Um, so instead of just going lives, 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 put it in a phrase. He lives in London. He lives in London. Uh, he lives in London. And repeat it 10 times. Make some changes um, and practice that way. If you want, you can record yourself practicing. Listen back and check that you're making the right sound. Great. That's number one. Let's move on. Now, the second most common grammar mistake is using the present tense instead of the past. And this happens a lot in part two of IELTS speaking, where sometimes you're describing a story, something that happened, an event in the past, right? So, for example, so I'd like to tell you about a time I go to a museum. Last summer, I go to a history museum in my city. I visit it with my friend Amy. Now, what's happening is I'm using the present tense instead of the past. So it should be. So I'd like to tell you about a time I went to a museum. Last summer, I went to a history museum in my city. I visited it with my friend Amy. OK, now here, um, I think the question is probably, it could be about pronunciation, but more often than not, it's just about forgetting. Because in part two, you're so focused on fluency, pronunciation, some nice vocabulary that you don't focus on the grammar and you're going and going and going and suddenly the past tense becomes the present. It may be that in your mother tongue, in your language, the past is not expressed in the same way. And so you're not focusing on it and you trip up and you start using the present. OK, it may be partly pronunciation, like you say, I visit it and you think you said visited, but you didn't. And it comes across as being the present tense. So again, this could be a pronunciation problem or a grammar problem. Okay, the fix here, here I think is just about focus, is to really focus on the past tense. So a really good idea for practicing part two anyway is to record yourself giving an answer to a part two question. But as you're recording, right, only focus on the past tense, right? You're going to give your answer, but you're really going to focus on the past tense to make sure you're using the past. And then when you listen back, only focus on the past tense. Don't worry about vocabulary or fluency. No, just focus. Did you get the past tense right? and practice getting that focus. Now, there is another trick, and it's a nice technique. It's a technique, not a trick. It's a technique. Um, what's the difference? Well, a trick sounds like something quick and easy, and a technique is actually a process and a way of studying. So this is a technique, and you can take some pieces of paper, right? Chop up, chop up maybe cut up some pieces of paper, right? Um, and then on a piece of paper, you choose a topic, choose a part two topic that's talking about the past. For example, right? A city I visited, right? By the way, um, I cut up pieces of paper. My wife, who's as sharp as a knife, she said, why are you doing that? Why don't you use these old name cards, right? I've got all these name cards that I don't use anymore. On the back, she said, why don't you use those? Bright as a button, she is. So you take them and on them, you write down 
some present tense or the verb of a phrase you're going to use in your part two. So if we're talking about a city I visited, I might write down, go to Paris, take the train, travel in economy class, take the overnight train, arrive early morning, and so on, right? And then what do I do? I just practice um, telling my story or my talk in the past tense, right, with these sentences. So first of all, I just use them, right? I went to Paris, yeah? Um, I took the train. Mm. Um, I travelled in economy class. Hear that? I travelled in, I'm using the linking, I travelled in economy class. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I actually took the overnight train because it was cheaper. Um, and then I arrived in the early morning because the train got into the station at eight o'clock and then I got off the train and I went for breakfast and you carry on and carry on, right? So we're using these nice little cue cards to help us practice and focus on the past tense. Lovely. Give it a go. Grammar mistake number three is... using uncountable nouns like they are countable. So uncountable nouns are nouns that you cannot count. Surprise, surprise. So for example, water, sugar, rice, right? Sugar as a noun, you can't say a sugar. No, we say some sugar, a lot of sugar, right? Um, you can't count sugar. If you do, you say a grain of sugar maybe, or a grain of rice, um, a cube, a sugar cube, a cube of sugar. You can count those, but sugar is uncountable. So we say a lot of sugar, some sugar, a little sugar, not a few, right? Uh, how much sugar do you want? Not how many, how much, okay? So these are uncountable nouns. So listen to these examples and see if you can spot um, the uncountable noun that I'm using as though it's countable. Here's the first one. I read an information last week about healthy living. I read an information. Information is uncountable. So you can't say an information. If you want to count it, you have to say a piece of information. Okay. Or uncountable some. I read some information last week about healthy living. Here's another one. An advice I got from my friend was, what's the mistake? Yeah, an advice. Advice is uncountable, right? Um, you can't say an advice. If you want to count it, you must say a piece of advice. Otherwise, it's some advice, um, how much advice, a little advice. Um, so some advice I got from my friend or a piece of advice I got from my friend was, right? And the last one, spot this one, another common one in IELTS speaking. I'd like to tell you about an important news I read last week. Yeah, news. An important news? No, you can't count news. Um, it must be some important news or, again, a piece of news. Okay, good. Now, probably what's happening here, what's the problem? Usually this is translation, usually. Um, that probably in your own mother tongue, um, either this word is countable um, or it works in another way. So advice, right? Well, in Spanish, un consejo. Jolín, un consejo. You can count it, right? Dos consejos. Um, but in English, you can't. It has to be a piece of advice. I know it sounds strange, but because it's different in English, you have to think in a different way. So the way around this is to stop translating. Try not to translate.
You know, I remember when I was learning French at school, right? This idea of things, of languages being different. And the teacher said, voilà, la table, the table. La table. I said, oh, great, la table. And then she said, le bureau, the office. And I said, la bureau. She said, no, 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 le bureau. I said, well, why? If it's la table, it's la bureau. No, because the table is feminine and the office is masculine. What? The table is feminine, la table, and the office, le bureau, is masculine. And I, I was like, what on earth are you talking about? Feminine tables? Because in English, it's the table, the office. There is no feminine or masculine, right? Same in Spanish, la ventana, right? The window, it's feminine, right? And even some words that are feminine in French are masculine in Spanish. They change gender. What is going on? So languages are interesting. Um, and a really important message here is to try not to translate. So what can you do? Well, first of all, let me tell you some of the most common uncountable nouns we get in IELTS speaking on the common topics and then just work on work and practice on using them correctly. So for example, right, many abstract nouns are uncountable like information, advice, news, knowledge, work, pollution. Many mass nouns um, are also uncountable. Equipment, transportation, traffic, accommodation. So take, take a leaf out of my wife's book. <laughs> take a leaf out of somebody's book means um, follow their advice. Uncountable advice. Take these little cards, right? We've got some name cards. Write down some of the uncountable words and then just practice, right? Information. Ah, yesterday I got some information. But practice juggling. Do you remember juggling words? Practice different tenses, different forms. I got some information. How much information do I need? Um, is that a lot of information? Oh, that's an interesting piece of information. There's a little information on their website. Right. So we're practicing getting it fixed that it's uncountable and we're using the much, little, some or a piece of if that's for this word. Right. Great. Lovely little cards. Go and have a go. <laughs> Let's move on. The next grammar mistake is not pronouncing the ED in the past tense correctly or at all. Now, you may be saying, hang on, Keith, that's a pronunciation mistake. Well, if you um, pronounce it incorrectly, it's a pronunciation mistake. But if you don't pronounce it at all, it's going to sound like the present tense. And so it's also a grammar mistake. Whoa. Two mistakes for the price of one. Oh, dear. So it's very important you get it right. OK, um, here's an example. Right. Let's have a look. Last month, I want to see a new film called 1917. I finally watched it yesterday and I really like it, although my friend hate it. Right. So I'm not pronouncing the ED. What it should be is... Last month, I wanted to see a new film called 1917. I finally watched it yesterday and I really liked it, although my friend hated it. OK, so there's a big difference. So what's happening here? Well, first of all, let's look at the, the grammar here. Here. So in the past tense, regular verbs take ed for writing but that ed can be pronounced three different ways t d id so if a verb ends with again a voiceless sound like a walk talk 
like, um, then it becomes, it, we pronounce the first one a t, walked, talked, hoped, liked, right? Walked, talked, hoped, liked. There's no voice, it's voiceless, okay? Say them with me because they are difficult consonants to get. Walked, talked, hoped, liked. And the way to practice it is to really slow down so you get it really clear. Okay, walked, walked, walked. Now, for verbs that end in a voiced sound, like a live, love, can hear, I'm doing this to, to feel it. Um, it's a d sound. Lived, loved, watched, raised. And it's a very soft, it's not a d, it's a raised, loved. It's very soft, right? And that's the problem. That's why it's often dropped, because it's so soft. And the third sound is the id sound. So any verb that ends in a sound which is a t or a d, so like visit uh, or want, it'll be id, visited, wanted. Okay, that's the third sound. So first of all, knowing the three sounds and practicing them, you can practice on this video, is the first thing. I think the biggest problem with this one is just that students have not trained their tongue. It really is about going down the gym and working out, training your tongue to make these difficult Sounds, we call them consonant clusters because there's two consonants together. Um, and in many languages, either words don't end in a consonant or they just end in one. So this is really, really tough. What can we do? Well, again, take a leaf out of my wife's book. Get some cards, right? And just write down some of these um, were any words, actually, any verbs. Just put them in the present or the infinitive, right? Um, you can make life easier by grouping them. So these are voiceless. Walk, talk, like. Huh. Walk, talk, like. These are voiceless. And then just practice putting them in the past. So, for example, I walked to the office. And again, slow it down. I walked to the office. I walked to the office. I talked to my colleagues. I liked my lunch. You don't need to make a story. Just practice these words making short phrases because it's important because the word after is, is what's really important, right? Because if you're just saying the word like talked, 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 you're on automatic pilot. But when you make a sentence, you're engaging your brain and you're forcing yourself to train your tongue and train your brain. I talked to my colleague. I talked to my boss. I talked about football. And you'll notice how the t becomes very strong when we connect. I talked about. I talked about football. And that can help you make it very, very clear. So, have a go. Moving on. Right, next up, last but not least, number five, using will for the future in the wrong place. And I'm talking about the first conditional. So many people think we use will for the future in English. And sometimes we do, but not all of the time. So can you spot the mistake here, right? So next year, if I will have a chance to go, I will visit London. What's the mistake? So next year, if I will have a chance to go, no. If I have a chance to go, I will visit London. It's the first conditional, right? It's if 
plus the verb in the present, comma, and then the next clause is the subject with will do something, will plus the verb, right? Um, if I have a chance next year, so although we're talking about the future, we use the present tense to express the future. If I, a conditional future, right? A supposed or imaginary future, but very probable. If I have a chance to go next year, I will visit London. We call it the first conditional and it's a big, very, very common mistake. Um, it catches out a lot of people. Why does it catch people out? And I think it's because students haven't automated this structure. They may be translating and thinking also that, you know, we use will for the future. It's not always the case. So if you haven't automated it, then the, the answer here or the fix is to automate it. So practice the first conditional sentences, getting it automatic, right? If it rains tomorrow, I will take my umbrella. Okay, it's practice and practice, of course. Um, there is an interesting game you can play, which is called the uh, what if game. But you have to talk to yourself and your family might think you've gone a little bit bonkers, <laughs> crazy, mad. So here's how it works, right? You say, what if, what if means like imagine, right? What will you do if, what if it rains tomorrow? And then you speak to yourself, well, if it rains tomorrow, I will take my umbrella. Notice, right? Not if it will rain tomorrow. If it rains tomorrow, I will take my umbrella. And then you ask yourself <laughs> again, yes, but what if your umbrella is broken? Well, <laughs> if my umbrella will be, no, is. If my umbrella is broken, I will borrow one from my friend. Look at yourself again. Yes, but what if your friend is out of town? Well, if my friend is out of town, I will buy a new one. And you go on with this Socratic dialogue and your family think you've gone mad. Why are you talking to yourself? Well, I was watching this video on YouTube and he said that I should, you know, talk to myself. Right. OK. <laughs> But you know, it's true. No, it's true. This is, it's an interesting technique. If you've got a speaking partner, well, do it together. Practice together. But if you need to do it on your own, this is how you can do it with the what if game. Great. I guess with all of these grammar mistakes, one of the key things is practice and getting correction, right? Either record yourself and listen to the mistakes and be be on your guard, look out for them, or get a teacher. Get somebody who can be listening to you, correcting you, giving you feedback. That's the best way. And what a great segue just to finish up today to remind you about Cambly. Because if you're looking for a teacher, Cambly, online flexibility, native English speaking teachers, um, they can really help you. It's so flexible and you can book whoever, whenever, wherever, um, but get that correction to really help nail and crack these grammar mistakes. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Cambly in San Francisco. <laughs> And that's it for today. Listen, just to remind you, if you haven't joined us on the Facebook, in the Facebook group yet, do come and join us. It's um, Keith's Mastermind Community for IELTS Speaking. Longest name in the world, but it's a fantastic group. Not because of me, but because of the other students in there. It's very active, some great stuff going on. Um, if you want to improve your, uh, your speaking, it's the place to be. So come and join us, right? The link's down below, Facebook group, Keith's Mastermind Community for IELTS Speaking. Listen, if you've enjoyed the video, please do um, give it a thumbs up or give me a comment, like it, subscribe, turn on notifications and enjoy the next video to carry on your learning journey for IELTS Speaking. And I will see you next time. Take care, my friend.
pas pareil. 